Come on. Chinchuk Mata Hatak. So hold your foot, Jared Impachan Chanha Tate. Impachan Chanha, Chokat Mitra Shawi Iksa, Ishtaun Chalulili, Talo Ikbili, Hashlaka Sayopa, Chukmashki, Yakoke. Hi, everyone. My name is Jared Impachan Chanha Tate. I am a citizen of the Chickasaw Nation in Oklahoma, and I am a professional classical composer. So, <laughs> this is our topic for today. There will be a test given at the end of the class period. <laughs> and I'll have scores done by and in your inboxes by eight o'clock tomorrow morning. So what is a Chickasaw classical composer? Of course, I'm asked this question often, and I love talking about this because I get to talk about all kinds of nerdy things that I really like to do. So anyway, so this is what I'm gonna to talk to you about today. And um, so I'd, I'd like to first start with saying, that let's talk about the word classical. I think that's a really important topic to cover. Um, so the word classical, as we all know, refers to what's considered Western fine art discipline. And the thing that's really interesting about that is that it's kind of perceived these days that classical art came from one time zone that's just like Paris and London. And that's really actually, that's not historically accurate at all. In fact, uh, the, the classical fine arts in all of the genres, I'm talking dance and literature and movies now, and of course composition and fashion and architecture and everything like that, um, in, in the Western sense, they actually have their origins, deep, deep origins in Northern Africa, the Mediterranean and the Middle East. And so when we talk about classical modes and music, and we nerd out on that, we're talking about stuff that was developed in Greece, and that is not Paris or London. And so anyway, I think it's really important to say that because to me, the, the classical fine arts, it, it's, a, it's a point of pride for me because to me, the classical fine arts is one of the most inclusive human inventions ever. That in science, science is also extremely inclusive. And the reason I say that is because the way it was developed was multinational. It took thousands of years. And by the time classical music became kind of caught and the arts became kind of codified, um, it's like it became this like this sentient cloud that would hover over everything. And, and it, it, it literally asks, it, it begs people to bring in their individual identity and experience, if that's ethnicity or nationality or just personal experience, it wants you to bring that in into this specific discipline of expression. And so it's almost like, it's like the, the martial arts. If you look at jujitsu or, or taekwondo, you know, you're looking at a classical art form that stays the art form that it is, but it invites everybody in the world to participate. It is non-exclusive. And that's what I love about the classical fine arts. And if you look at the materials, people that use the materials from, from Western you know, uh, tradition, well, it's, they're not Aboriginal to those folks who ever used that at the time. So like with American Indians, you talk about painters and sculptors where we're using, a, this is you know, a Brent Greenwood, he's a Chickasaw artist and he's using acrylics. Is this oil or acrylic? I'm sorry, my, my ignorance. That are not in a canvas and it's not Aboriginal from this part of the world. So it's something I'm very, very proud about. And so when we talk about a classical music, um, the history of classical music has tons of ethnicity and nationality infused into it from all over the world. So like, for instance, so if we're asking what's a Chickasaw classical composer, well, what's a Russian classical composer? Well, Tchaikovsky was definitely a Russian classical composer. Could you be more Russian than that? <laughs> it's not possible. And that is, that is Russian folk music that's being played in that in a symphonic form. So then you've got somebody like Claude Debussy, who is a French composer. Yeah. 
So what's really cool about that is that that's about every soundtrack you know now. WC was really influential on our popular soundtrack sound. And that's, I mean, that's not going away. But that is so French. That, they, of course, you know, the French are known for their impressionism. And this was one of his impressionistic pieces called La Mer, which is the sea. And there you go. That's his um, depiction of the sea. And then you have somebody like Chinnery Ung, who is a classical Cambodian composer. I think that's just marvelous. So here you've got a piano and percussion and a cello, and he's expressing deep Cambodian identity in this music, and it's unmistakably Cambodian. This is just absolutely amazing what classical music avails us as a tool. So Jared Tate is a Chickasaw classical composer. The end of the spoken, the end of the spoken sung, the sung, the dreamed into the dream into the fire, fire. Into the fire. We are, that is when we are new and begin. Clouds, the clouds rise up. The treaty of open has spoken to all, all the nights and fires. All along the all sacred forest and river and stone, stone, and stone with its own words. The telling could, the telling begin. could begin. Once it, and once it begins, it may continue. One sea, one life, one life, one thing, one thing. One word, one word growing after another. Yo, Lenny, you all, 
Waltz duo, duo. Hey! <laughs> so as a Chickasaw classical composer, what I do professionally is I focus on entirely on North American um, culture, history, and what I like to call ethos. There is a certain ethos that does exist that is quite monolithic through North America that I focus on. And um, so anyway, that's, that's the basic answer to what is a Chickasaw classical composer. I'd like to cover some other things here um, that are fun for me. I'm going to nerd out a little bit here. But also, I guess what I'd like to do is talk about my origins. And it's really important for me to talk about my parents. My father, Charles, um, was born and raised in Ardmore, Oklahoma. He's Chickasaw. And my dad uh, graduated OU Law, um, and uh, he became a professional tribal judge, uh, uh, a lawyer, and he was counsel to our Chickasaw legislature. But more importantly, dad is author to our current Chickasaw constitution. And for those of you who don't know, every American Indian tribe, and I say specifically American Indian tribes, have our own constitutions that run in tandem with the US Constitution. So we, are, we have dual citizenship. So I'm a citizen of the Chickasaw Nation, and I'm also a citizen of the United States of America. Um, and so dad um, also is a phenomenally trained classical pianist and baritone. And so I grew up with my Chickasaw father playing classical repertoire like Rachmaninoff and Bach um, and WC in the house. And um, he also sang opera. And so it's really funny because my dad also played accordion and he did the whole Lady in the Tramp thing. He gigged accordion and sang Italian arias in restaurants. A Chickasaw guy, only in America will you see something like that happen. <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, I'm very, very proud of that. And so this, uh, that's Justice Yvonne Cogger um, swearing him, and he's now on the board of the Oklahoma Historical Society. My family, I, I'll tell you, uh, I'm, as I get older, I, I take inventory of my life, and I think about all the tools and all the things that my parents gave me, and it's really, really quite amazing, and my gratitude just increases. But my father just exposed me to so much and I grew up with a great working knowledge of Indian law and politics throughout the United States. In fact, my dad's first big gig in the 70s when he graduated from Norman was he went out and worked with all 19 Pueblos on the water rights issues that were going on in the 1970s. That's a big deal, especially in Indian country. And my, that, that was normal to me. But also becoming from Oklahoma where we have 39 federally recognized tribes, my dad was traveling all the time. I was around tons of American Indian music and culture and law. I went to the sovereignty symposiums in Tulsa when I, in the 80s when I was a kid with my dad. And I thought it was amazing to see tribal cops and state cops and, and uh, federal cops talking to each other. So I know I'm tangenting, but it's just amazing what I learned from him. But also dad's piano playing really affected me. And so when I was eight years old, I told dad, I want to play the piano. He goes, okay. So we started and I started my lessons. And within three months, I had announced to my family, I was to be a concert pianist. <laughs> So this is a little bit more about us, so that's our, that's our seal. But my name, Impecha Chaha, is my inherited house name from my dad. And Impecha Chaha means raised corn crib or high corn crib. And this is literally one of our ancient type of structures that's where you just store veggies. And so it is a symbol of prosperity, but, um, but that's what Impecha Chaha means. It means high corn crib. This is my mom, Patricia. And... <clears throat> Um, mom was born and raised in Lincoln, Nebraska. Actually, she's born in Omaha, raised in Lincoln. And um, mom uh, was, uh, was Manx, and so uh, Manx Irish. So I am Manx and Chickasaw. In fact, Harold advances. This is, our, this is our Manx flag. I like this because it means it's kicking off independence from the, other, the rest of the Commonwealth. And so that's a really cool little <laughs> thing. <laughs> Just because I got attitude, that's all. Okay. So, but mom... Um, Mom was extremely, so my parents met an Enid at, at when they went to Phillips University, when that was the university. And so, but my mother exposed me to an enormous amount of theater and dance. And this had an incredible impact on my life. I grew up a total theater brat. And so, um, and so my heroes artistically as a kid, American heroes were choreographers like Isadora Duncan 
and Martha Graham and Ruth St. Dennis and Ted Shawn, the, the Dennis Shawn dancers. That's where so many American dancers were groomed earlier on. And so then, of course, later on, Bob Fosse and Jerome Robbins and Alvin Ailey and Palabalus and those types of groups really were part of my normal wheelhouse. And along with that came the finest music ever written. My mom staged Prokofiev, uh, uh, yeah, Romeo and Juliet, The Rite of Spring, Firebird, Petrushka, Soldier's Tale on her students. I grew up with the finest symphonic music ever created for the theater, or, or just at all. And so, and then also it was in the 70s, so it was the Moog synthesizer was in. So I grew up with all this like, you know, really cool 70s music. And, and it was, I was just saturated with modern American theater and dance. But also there was a, a particular author that my mom brought attention to, to me was Joseph Campbell. And Joseph Campbell was Catholic and then became a, a, a theological historian and talked about the universal themes of hero, the hero's journey, the, the universal stories that exist throughout, um, throughout all ancient cultures, all ancient cultures, they have this thread. And so you can see where this is going. So by the time um, I was, I had graduated Northwestern University. Oh, sorry, that was my grandmother. I'll talk about her in a sec. Um, my, uh, I graduated with my piano degree. I was starting the piano performance at, um, uh, at the Cleveland Institute of Music for my master's degree. My mom had approached me, she was going to do a new ballet. She'd just done a ballet based on Ella Watson who was hanged for cattle rustling in Wyoming. It was a very low, she taught at the University of Wyoming for 30 years. And so she wanted to do another ballet that was based on American Indian legends from the Northern Plains and Rockies. And so I was graduating Northwestern and she called me, she's like, so you're gonna do the score, right? And it was that casual. And I said, uh, no, absolutely not. You're crazy. That's impossible. I, how can I write a ballet? I just absolutely freaked out. And so now <laughs> my mom knew what she was doing. So she planted the seed and it stuck really, really beautifully. Now, one thing that was just so cool was that my mom in a very beautiful and innocent way was asking me to be all of who I am at the exact same time. And that is a Chickasaw man who's a classical composer composing symphonic music about American Indians. That was pretty amazing. And so, but now I will, so our first ballad, the first piece that I did was in 1991 and 92 called Winter Moons. Uh, in fact, you can hear that on Spotify now. It just came out last month. So you can hear that also on YouTube. So you can listen to that if you want. And also there's a video on my YouTube channel. You can watch the ballet. I'm gonna play a little bit of that. But anyway, so, so, but mom was at the University of Wyoming. So she focused on those tribes. Those aren't my tribes. And so I, I really took this very seriously. I didn't want to just appropriate from another tribe, even though they're my cousins, I wanted to be respectful. So, and the reason I'm telling you all this is because we're already leading into the orchestrations that I was thinking about how to apply this. And, you know, it was really funny because here I was playing people like WC and Bartok and Prokofiev and Beethoven. These were all ethnic composers. You know, and, and, and I had, I, I was, I was given, being given composition lessons, playing piano literature. And it's like, of course, that makes total sense. I mean, it's like you play a piano sonata Beethoven, you learn how to write a piano sonata. There it is right there. So anyway, that's, that's just something that was going, but I just, it never occurred to me that my Chickasaw identity and my classical identity would have anything to do with each other. They were just what they were. But here mom said this, you put this on the table and there it went. So, so winter moons um, start, started out with the four moons, um, the, the solos. And so we were able to perform it with a Colorado ballet. And so I'd like to play you uh, the winter moon solo herself. In this piece, this is where I was like, okay, I want to work and, and identify the flute, of course, because it's plains music, but our flutes all over the country are not the same flutes that you hear today. You, you we hear very developed in tune with all kinds of different woods with different timbres and richness. And, but our old flutes were actually mostly cane, river cane. And so they were much higher and more shrill sounding, almost like a piccolo. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to start. So this is, you can, you're going to hear the orchestrations where it's the piccolo solo joined by the bassoon and there's the full orchestra. So this is where I was starting to orchestrate, reorchestrate our traditional musics. <clears throat>
winter winds, mumble waters, whisper, quiver, and wind in the distance. She was still star, a daughter of the As the next year's moon, her final gift. So my, my grandmother was able to come out to the performance in Rapid City, and um, this was so. This is my grandmother's graduation picture from the Shalaka Indian School in uh, 2000. Uh, 2000. <laughs> it closed in 1981. In, the, in 1918, uh, 1928 is when she graduated, and uh, this was me and grandmother. My very first concert in Oklahoma. It was in Oklahoma City, and so. But I so after after this whole experience with Winter Moons, the narrator that you saw was Rodney Grant. He was one of the actors from Dances with Wolves. And Rodney was just hammering me. He was like, dude, you've got to do this. And the support I got from both the Native and the classical communities was just overwhelming. And so I'm very, very grateful for that. Of course, you know, my predecessor to that was Dr. Lewis Ballard. And so I knew his work, but I didn't know if I could do the same thing. I didn't know if I was talented enough to do the exact same work that he was doing. I just didn't know. So I had to really think about that. And so what happened is I went back to, I talked to my grandmother. I told her what I wanted to do. She gave me the big thumbs up and um, I went back to the Cleveland Institute of Music and I added composition to my degree and I announced to my family then that I was to be a Chickasaw classical composer. So um, now let's see here. Sorry. <laughs> So 
So Chickasaw's music is shell shaking music. And so you heard me playing a shell shaker here. I, I combine it with this because the timbre is really good. But these, these, are, these turtle rattles are our, are our traditional music. And so um, I've got, a, I just have a little bit of a learning lesson here that I want to show you stomp dancing just broken down. And so I went down uh, years ago to Cullahoma and filmed my colleagues down at the tribe and asked if we could do some demos that I could take with me and show people because you can't travel with a dance troupe all the time. So, but these are what our traditional shells look like wrapped around the gal's legs. And it's only the women who can do the percussion and the turtle shells that's exclusive to the women. So the men will sing the songs, but the women are, are shell shaking. And so when you do stomp dances, it's all night. And this is, this is heavy on your legs. And so it's a really, really big responsibility. So the women do they do they do part of the community response as well so they will sing if they're not out of breath um so um but this is but this is what it looks like it's really really beautiful and so what i'm going to do is i'm going to show you a demonstration of shell shaking and what they're but they're wearing condensed milk cans instead of the actual tool rattles because these are fragile and and when they're touring and doing demonstrations it, uh, shell shaking with all the muskogees and choctaws and chickasaws and seminoles has we used cans instead and so people they called their cans you have your cans with you and stuff like that and you take your so you can throw them on buses and they're okay but these will break so that's what they're going to show you here I'm Judy I'm Thomas. Judy Thomas. I've, been I've been shelter about, about a year, year. and I'm and by, by no means, no means perfect. perfect. I'm still learning, still learning. but um, I would just start out. Start out. And get your heel, get your heel, get your heel, get your heel, get your heel. You just have to practice, practice first without without shell. I've been to shows and I enjoy it. You want a fast rhythm or a slow rhythm? Okay. So, okay, so that's shell shaking isolated. Yeah, isn't that great? <laughs> and you heard Tim giving a Rhonda hard time. She, she's like, sing of the blues. Okay, so just so you know, it's an off topic um, ethnomusicological thing. And that is about the origin and the robustness of the blues and how um, Southeastern American Indians um, actually affected that. So music history is always much more robust than, than, it's, than we always portray it. But there's, there's a lot of influence of Southeastern music um, in the blues as well. And that's like a whole different topic. That's really cool. It's really, really awesome when you dive into it. So, but that's what he's talking about. So when they do stomp dancing, people often say they're singing the blues. So, um, okay, so that's a demonstration of the shell shaking just isolated. So now what I'd like to do is I'd like to show you just like kind of like the full journey of like people like, so how do you go from 
over here to that. And so I'm gonna show you that exactly through film. And so we're gonna start out and Tim is gonna talk about the double header dance. Uh, now it's, uh, it's so uh, hopefully you'll be able to hear that, but I just wanna tell you what he's talking about. He's talking about that the double header is a dance in which two families come together and they're celebrating. They're praying for a good crop and a good season and they're pr praying for prosperity for their family and their tribe. So that's, it's, it's a social dance, it's full of joy. And, and so you'll hear that he's going to talk about that. Then you'll hear them do a, a snippet of that. And then you'll see what happened when I put the dance troupe on stage with a full orchestra doing that and then into a full orchestra, kind of like a cascading sound with this. And so the tune that you'll want to keep in mind as, as it's being played is, is this repetitive tune. Oh, yeah, 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 oh, yeah, 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 do, 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 do. It's just a major scale. F sharp, E, D, da, 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 just like that, just over and over and over. So you can hear that tune and then you can hear how that becomes a full orchestration and transcribed throughout. So here is the journey through the double header. It's dead. Double hitters, double hitters. As Brun dropped by, by, back two, back two, two leaders. leaders. And that two, two leaders, 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 is because two, two men are singing. Are singing. And as they sing, and they sing, and they sing. They sing and the open the beginning, the beginning of the double hitter, double hitter that there's four yells, four yells is to awaken the, the creator. So awakening the creator, creator. these two men these are, two singing are singing to the creator. To the creator. And everybody, and everybody is answering, answering and chanting, chanting, chanting after them, after, them, after, after they're after singing. They're singing. And, uh, and double, double hitters, hitters is why they face east. east. The man's face east. east. is because that's, 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 they believe that's the way the creator had came from this creation. So in the double hitter, you're chanting. Song, song, back, back and, and forth, forth to one another, one another. And, dancing, and dancing, and this, and this, and this song. The creator is listening, listening, and as through, and as through it, he talks, he talks through, through the leaders, the leaders of this song. Of this song. And answer, and answer, whatever you all, whatever, whatever your chat is, is, and whatever your life is, life is, is what he's doing. He's doing. It's answering, answering, answer, 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 and giving you, giving you all the rights, all the rights to whatever you ask for, asking for, for the people. So in this, in this uh, the double hitter, the double hitter, and that song that they, they, they they're telling you, telling you, and it's just the beginning of, of it. But your song but changes, your song changes, your chant, your chant, and so, and so in your chant, your chant, that's what that's to what, us, that's what, what, what you do is that you ask, you're asking for your people, for what you need, what you need for them. A great crop, a great crop, a good hunt, good hunt season, season, good, good rainy season, you know, things for wealth, for wealth, health, people, people. And double hitters, and double hitters. And so they come so they together, come together as in as two, clans, two clans, speaking to, speaking one, another, to one another, asking the asking creator, creator to awaken, to awaken, to hear our prayers. That's basically, basically, basically double hitters. Double hitters. Double hitters. Yeah, yeah, learn, learn, learn,
Hi. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so fortunate my grandmother was able to be at that performance. And so she was able to see all this stuff coming through, uh, for, through uh, to fruition, excuse me. Okay, let's see here. I am already going over and oh, I have so much content that I want to show you. Okay, so I'm gonna choose something here and I'm gonna go ahead and do this. We're gonna nerd out and it's gonna be a little more of the classroom type of thing. And so we want to show you more of what, how I kind of put this together, okay? So, okay, there was a project in, in this, it was called that, where I was going to write music for one of our stories called Spider Brings Fire. And Spider Brings Fire is a fire origin story, which so many people around the world have. Again, this is like the Joseph Campbell part of me going, yeah, I want to show people that we've got this universal tale. Well, it's one of our critical stories, along, that along with Shell Shaker. Um, and so um, anyway, so I, I had this opportunity to do this and Dustin Mater, our Chickasaw artist, was going to create the animation that goes with it and everything like that. So I'm like, okay, so material, what am I thinking? I'm looking through our songs. I'm thinking about what we can use. And we don't have any spider songs. I'm like, ah, there's no spider songs. But we do have a tick dance song and they are both arachnids <laughs> so here here is the tick and so so here's the tick dance and i want to i want to play one of our older recordings from our group from the 70s playing this Yahweh. So then what I do is I, whoops, sorry, I skipped slides. Oh, I thought I could do this. Okay, sorry about that. There we go. I'll pass by. Oh, Excuse me. Okay, it's not going to let me do this. All right, so I got to talk fast. Okay, so I'm going to give you a little bit of preview. These are students of mine. Okay, so what I do is when I'll take a song like that, happens to be in a 3-4, that's so easy to do, but I, I transcribe music like Bela Bartok did with his folk music. So he went around when the Wax Roll Recorder came out and was recording music from his own village people, like singing their, their traditional songs that he grew up with. And so he went out and recorded them, transcribed them, and started to create language that was really specific to that sound. It was really, really cool. So with that in mind, I went out and started transcribing our, our music. And this is one of the Tick Dance songs that, we transcri that I transcribed. I'm sorry to do this here. Oops, hang on. Do this. Let's fast forward again. There we go. Okay, so now. So this is the actual written transcription. And that's the top line right there. And then there's four. So now I got to pick now here's just the call itself. So then I transcribe it for horns in the orchestra. the response in the song that the community sings back to the lead singer. And that is transcribed for all the strings and woodwinds in the orchestra. Now, here is the full song, and then you'll hear the full orchestration.
illustration starts with the shells at the beginning. with the animation that shows a panoramic view of the old country, Mississippi. So there's a little bit of a journey into my process. It's five o'clock. And so I've filled your minds with stuff for, for an hour. I could play you one more example if you want, or I could take a couple of questions. Okay, all right, okay. Okay, <laughs> I, I appreciate that. I'm gonna do a little bit of a plug because this is actually from the opera that I'm about to premiere in February in Massachusetts. And this is another one of our really critical tales about the shell shaking. It's the origin of the shell shakers. And this opera is called Shell Shaker. And it is based on, uh, well, I'm sorry. That, well, it's, uh, we have, I'm, just, uh, I'm getting all confused. There's so many cool things about it. Okay, so anyway, that's what I'm working on right now. And I wanna play you an example of how I treat our music with operatic material. And so for, for example, one of the th hymns that we sing out of is Chickasaw, this is the Choctaw hymnal. Choctaws and Chickasaws sing out of the same hymnal. And these are hymns that have their own history and the repertoire and the canon is about 250 years old now. And so, but these are old songs that we have that we sing in Indian church. And so I wanna sing you one of those songs and then give you an example of what, how this transforms into opera. So hang on, let me pull up that slide real quick. Do, 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 do. Come on, let's go. Do. Okay. So the song that you're about to hear transcribed for orchestra with classical singers um, is, is a song that was, from what I understand, was created during the removal when we walked from Mississippi to Oklahoma in the 1830s. And it's a song that was uh, that projected hope. The text is very Christian because we were at that time, we were very, very mixed in our religion when, by the time we were removed. And so uh, most uh, American Indians at the time were, were Christians. And so this was a, this kind of like a hybrid music that was created out of it. It's really cool. It's got a neat history to it. But the song goes like this. Ayo Chaya So 
So tell me that does not beg to be opera. <laughs>